to blame Putin for it is, 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 is absurd for the very simple reason that after all, Putin's response was to the sanctions imposed by the West on Russia. So, so the point is that you cannot impose sanctions on somebody and expect that somebody not to do anything about it. And in the process, the European economies are really getting completely ruined. This is really uh, taxing European workers to uh, uh, promote America's strategic objectives. But every such move, by the way, is going to strengthen the fascists in Europe. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. The war in Ukraine exposed Western narcissism and amnesia. From a Western point of view, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a unique event, unprovoked and unprecedented since World War II. Why couldn't people of the Global South understand this? Why didn't they get on board this great crusade to demonize Russia and support Ukraine? When the war in Ukraine began, Western officials bragged that they were going to turn the ruble into rubble and bring Russia to its knees. Seven months later, it's Europe's currency that's turning to rubble, and it's Europe which is being brought to its knees. It turns out, sanctioning your largest gas supplier with no alternative in place following years of stagnation and an economy-destroying pandemic isn't such a great idea. Meanwhile, fascists are winning elections in countries like Sweden and Italy, pointing to a possible trend across the EU. As Europe prepares for winter blackouts and a coming recession, some are wondering if the EU is committing suicide by placing itself on the front line of the US Cold War against Russia and China, two countries that Europe relies on for raw commodities. And what will such policies do to local politics as it destroys the European working class in service to US imperialism? In the meantime, the war drags on and unlike the pathetic efforts at conflict resolution in Syria or Yemen, there are no special envoys pursuing ceasefires or solutions. We tend to hear only Western voices analyzing and explaining these issues from a liberal Western capitalist perspective, but that represents a minority of the world's population. How does the rest of the world see it? For one global perspective, I'm joined by Prabhat Patnaik, Marxist economist, professor emeritus at JNU, an author of many books, including A Theory of Imperialism and the more recent Capital and Imperialism, Theory, History, and the Present, both co-authored with Utza Patnayak. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Professor Patnayak, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you back on to, to revisit uh, one of the, a lot of the issues that we talked about the last time I had you on. You've been writing so many excellent pieces on everything happening economically, as well as with the rise of uh, these sort of fascists being elected in various countries like Sweden and Italy. So I want to get to all of that. But since you and your wife, of course, wrote the book on imperialism, have written several books on imperialism, I thought a good place to start would be to ask about your reaction to the latest statement of the EU foreign affairs head, Joseph Burrell. Um, and I'm, for those who aren't aware or just to remind people about what he said last week, uh, which went viral, I'm just gonna go ahead and quote him. He said, yes, Europe is a garden, we have built a garden. The rest of the world, and you know this very well, is not exactly a garden. Most of the rest of the world is a jungle, and the jungle could invade the garden. And so, Professor Padnaik, what were your what were your thoughts when you saw when you saw this statement? Um, because it's almost like the perfect uh uh sort of symbol of imperialism to speak about from the European perspective, this garden and jungle. Yes, I, I was I was quite amazed by the brazenness of that statement, you know, is the kind of thing that one thought that people had stopped using such language 
but the fact that this person, very responsible senior person, has started using that language really quite amazed me. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it really summarizes the kind of relationship of imperialism that still exists between um, Europe and America on the one hand, and the Western powers, that is, and the rest of the world on the other. I mean, indeed. And of course, it's, it was also just interesting to hear uh, him express fears of being invaded by the jungle when we're going to talk about the rest of the world as a jungle. No one's done more invading than the garden. Um, but, you know, just to move on to a topic that you have written a few articles about and that has been in the news a lot recently. Uh, and this is before what, you know, before we get into Europe's kind of like economic self-destruction. I also wanted to get your reaction to the way that the U.S. has handled the Saudis refusing to produce more oil. Um, you've seen a lot of statements coming from American officials. On the one hand, very contradictory statements, right? On the one hand, we hear American officials saying, no, we don't sell, tell the Saudis what to do. And then on the other hand, you've seen these kinds of veiled threats or some sort of open threats that we're going to punish the Saudis if they don't do what we tell them to do, if they continue to join Russia and refusing to increase oil production. But what's interesting about this is the Saudis warned the U.S. that they were going to cut oil output. And then the U.S. acted so shocked when it happened. And I think, you know, that just made America look very weak and, and stupid uh, on the international stage, at least. And like I mentioned, you've written a few articles about this. I'll link to them in the description. But I'm curious, how do you view the Saudi decision to ignore U.S. demands? And do you think that this shows that the U.S. is losing its hegemony over its own proxies and puppet regimes? Oh, yes, it certainly is losing its hegemony. But you see, the way the Americans have posed the problem, they told the Saudis, uh, you either choose us or you choose the Russians. In other words, it's the choice between America and Russia where the decision to cut oil output is something which is posed as a choice between America and Russia. I think that's completely wrong because it is true that the Russians would benefit out of it. But I think by deciding to cut the oil output, this the, 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 the Saudis are actually doing something that would benefit their own economy. Because after all, you have a situation where the world is heading towards a recession. In any recession, primary commodity prices fall quite sharply. And therefore, the Saudis wanted to cut oil uh, output in order to make sure that this fall is arrested. And since oil is a commodity where the demand is price inelastic, such a reduction in output, if it keeps up prices, would actually give much larger oil revenue to the Saudis and indeed to the other oil producing countries. So it makes perfect sense from their point of view. And I don't see why they should have listened to the Americans. This whole business of either you are with us or with the Russians is uh, uh, completely erroneous. So I think the Saudis have decided to do something which is of benefit to their own economy. It's another thing that all these years they listened to the Americans. Now on this, Biden himself went to Saudi Arabia, sent innumerable uh, emissaries to Saudi Arabia to persuade them uh, not to cut output. Uh, but on the other hand, the fact that the Saudis have done so, which is perfectly sensible from their point of view, does show that they are now willing to actually do things independent of the American wishes. And uh, yeah, and that must be really scary in the United States. And then, you know, I want to move to the issue of what's happening both in the U.S., but more so in Europe. You know, in the U.S., we're told by our leaders that this inflation that we're seeing, uh, these high gas prices that we're seeing, it's really Putin's inflation and P Putin's gas hike. And of course, you know, this to me sounds like an attempt to really displace blame from Western sanctions and even other economic choices in recent years, uh, place that displace that blame onto Russia. And in a recent article, which I'll also link to uh, in the description of this episode, you write that the narrative that the acceleration of inflation is entirely because of the energy and food shortage caused by the Ukraine war is not correct. So I'm wondering if you can explain the true causes of the inflation we're seeing in Europe right now and of course, in many ways, this is impacting the entire world. 
which, as you say, began before the war in Ukraine. And of course, the war in Ukraine and the sanctions have just added to it. Absolutely. In fact, the inflation, the acceleration in the rate of inflation began before the Ukraine war. It began when the, the Western countries decided to uh, reflate their economies. In other words, you know, uh, during the pandemic, a whole lot of measures had been taken, which had pumped liquidity into the economy, substantial amounts of liquidity into the economy. And the moment there was an effort to increase the output, you know, I mean, the moment the world came out of the uh, pandemic induced uh, uh, stoppage of production, you know, uh, uh, bottlenecks on production, you actually had a revival of inflation, a revival of inflation that was also fed by this buildup of liquidity earlier. As a matter of fact, you found, for instance, that oil companies jacked up their profit margins quite substantially, so much so that in Britain, the liberal democratic party wanted a tax on the super profits which the oil company was making but on the other hand that was turned down so so the thing is that that you know people were talking about the super profits of the oil companies the oil companies were jacking up their prices jacking up their profit margins before the ukraine war began after the Ukraine war, of course, this tendency has got further exacerbated. And to blame Putin for it is, 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 is absurd for the very simple reason that, after all, Putin's response was to the sanctions imposed by the West on Russia. So, so the point is that you cannot impose sanctions on somebody and expect that somebody not to do anything about it. So, so the fact that Putin actually uh, put a stop to gas supplies to Western Europe is something which arises as his response or, or Russia's response to the sanctions which are imposed by the, the Western powers. And you know, the, the, the Western powers are in the habit of imposing sanctions which actually go against all norms of international business behavior. This right. began with Iran. You see, Iran had actually got substantial amount of reserves, which were held in uh, in the form, you know, I mean, with the American banks. The fact that much earlier, the American government directed the banks to freeze the Iranian reserves actually goes against any kind of business dealings. And that is exactly what the Americans have been doing even subsequently vis-a-vis -vis other countries which have uh, been sanctioned by them, including Russia at the, at the moment. You know, the fact that you cannot transfer funds from the European or American banks to Russia is something uh, which is which is against all business behavior. Yeah, and that's a good point. So much for free markets. <laughs> um, that's and then right, of, exactly. And, and then, of course, the response, as you've written as well, has been for the central banks in the U.S. and Europe to increase interest rates, which is this kind of capitalist conventional wisdom. And they don't say it like this, but the idea of increasing interest rates is actually to bring up unemployment so that people can't purchase as much. So if you reduce that's purchasing right. power, that's how they want to deal with inflation. And I love the way you frame this, because you framed this as essentially by choosing to raise interest rates, which is what capitalists do to, to deal with inflation, it's actually placing a tax on the working class. So in the case of the war in Ukraine, and I'm going to quote you here, you you write, Europe, which is in the throes of serious inflation, is seeking to, inflo to control inflation in the only way that a capitalist economy controls inflation, that is at the expense of the working class, by squeezing the working class. Since the recent acceleration of inflation in Europe has been caused by the sanctions imposed on Russia at the behest of the U.S. as a sequel to the Ukraine war, one can legitimately assert that the U.S. is fighting a war against Russia by taxing the European working class. I think that's a really powerful characterization of what's happening here. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that, the idea that the United States is taxing the European working class to weaken Russia. Yes, you know, let's look at the war itself. Before the war began, there was the Minsk Agreement, which the French and the Germans were a party to. But of course, the Minsk Agreements were sabotaged because of Anglo-American intervention. Even after the war began, uh, 
in April, there was some kind of a peace accord which was being talked about, which, which, which perhaps had been finalized, but that was again prevented by the Anglo-American uh, 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 intervention. In fact, Boris Johnson actually went to uh, Ukraine to Kiev to tell Zelensky that, that, look, if you sign this accord, then you are not going to get any more support from us. So effectively, they arm twisted Zelensky into continuing with the war. So it's a war which is really at the behest of the Anglo-American alliance, the Anglo-American understanding. Uh, and it is really to... to to weaken Russia. In fact, it's by now quite well known that they actually want Russia to get bogged down in this war exactly the way that had happened in Afghanistan so that actually Russia gets weakened. And if Russia gets weakened, possibly there'd be a regime change and you'd find that a regime that is more favorable to the Americans would come up in Russia. That's basically their reading of what is possible. In any case, the idea is to weaken Russia. Now, how do they do this? They do this by persuading Europe to fall in line behind them. And such is the level of political leadership in the EU at the moment that the EU does fall in behind them. I mean, unlike the period when de Gaulle was, there, there, there were politicians like de Gaulle or Willy Brandt and so on, who actually decided to take an independent line vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. The current leadership in the EU completely toes the, the American line. As a matter of fact, Oscar Lafontaine said that Germany has become a vassal of the United States. So, uh, and, and, and in the process, the European economies are really getting completely ruined. You actually have now industrial units shifting from Germany to America because of the fact that they visualize that this power shortage or energy shortage in Europe and in Germany is going to continue for a while. So instead of closing down their factories forever, they want to actually shift to America. And this is something which is happening. Now, the way in which capitalism, any capitalist economy deals with inflation is, of course, as you mentioned rightly, by generating unemployment. By generating unemployment on the one hand and by reducing the primary commodity prices on the other, which is exactly where the oil country, OPEC country's decision to curtail output comes in here because they are basically telling Western powers that we don't want our prices to fall. Okay, so so on, on, uh, otherwise, just imagine what is the connection between interest rate on the one hand and the rate of inflation on the other. Obviously, the interest rate rise is meant to generate unemployment, generate lesser demand, and weaken the bargaining strength of the workers so that uh, no matter what has caused the inflation, the solution is found in beating down the working class. So the Americans want a war to continue. That war is going to squeeze the workers, not only through inflation, but additionally by generating unemployment as a means of countering inflation. And all this is essentially taxing the workers and taxing above all the European workers. Because the American workers themselves are to some extent being provided some relief because of the, the decision of Joe Biden to release 15 million barrels of their oil reserves to keep prices relatively stable because an election is coming up there. But as far as European Union is concerned, this is really uh, taxing European workers to uh, uh, promote America's strategic objectives. But every such move, by the way, is going to strengthen the fascists in Europe. And I, I do want to get to that because that is what we're starting to see the beginnings of here. But, you know, European countries, like you mentioned, they're they're sacrificing all basically sacrificing their working class at the altar of American hegemony. And they're talking about rationing electricity. They're talk they're talking or warning about blackouts this winter. Electricity has already become 
incredibly unaffordable. Now I live in Lebanon, which has been dealing with electricity blackouts <laughs> for, you know, I've been dealing with this for two years. So to me, this isn't new. It's like almost like Lebanon is more prepared to deal with it because we have generators. The Europeans don't have generators. So I don't think that they're prepared to deal with blackouts. But, you know, you need, like you mentioned, you know, German industry appears to be collapsing, which is very important for the German economy. The German economy is projected to contract this year. And even after the very, what was very likely U.S. sabotage of Nord Stream 2, it's just amazing that Europe is still blindly following America over the edge of this cliff. And even, you know, the U.K., the U.K.'s national grid has warned British households to prepare for blackouts between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. on really, really cold weekdays in January and February. And the BBC has prepared like these secret scripts that they're going to read on air if energy shortages cause blackouts or the loss of gas supplies in the winter. I mean, it's just really stunning stuff to see in what's supposed to be like the most developed part of the world, right? You also have people in Poland are starting to burn trash to stay warm. So I guess I say all this to ask you, why is Europe doing this to itself? Like, is it just a total lack of sovereignty? Is it an ideological belief in like the American project for some un, un like uh, for some reason I don't understand? Why would you sanction your biggest gas supplier um, and allow this to happen to your economies? Uh, and for what? Like, what does Europe have to gain? It doesn't make any sense to me. Can you make it make sense? <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, the question you are asking is exactly the question which the D-Linke leader, Sarah Wagenknecht, had actually asked. Because she says, imagine how stupid it is for a country <laughs> to actually uh, have hostilities vis-a-vis -vis another, which is his main energy supplier. And uh, hostilities, moreover, which can be resolved. You see, if, if, if it is the case, the Russians want peace. The Germans should want peace. In fact, the Germans, at one point, after all, they were involved in the Minsk Agreement. So the Germans, at one point, were interested in peace. But on the other hand, you find Joseph Borrell saying that the only way that the Ukraine war can be can be can be ended is on the battlefield. In other words, there is no question of 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 any peace. And therefore, in Europe, I think. There, there is, of course, a contradiction in the attitudes. On the one hand, they follow the Americans, but on the other hand, there is a, a, a feeling, a, an important subterranean feeling that they should get out of it. And by the way, there are huge working class demonstrations all over Europe, including in Germany, including in, in, in the Czech Republic including in France, everywhere in Europe, you're actually having huge working class demonstrations against these kinds of this 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 taxation that is being imposed on the workers at, at the behest of the Americans. Now, why is there this uh, tendency to follow the Americans? I think that's a very difficult question, but, but some, obviously, some answers would be, on the one hand, I think the disconnect between the political leadership and the, the and the people at large is just enormous. I mean, this is a disconnect, the level of which I believe has not existed since the period of the First World War. Because in the First World War, you actually found that actually uh, the governments were in war and the people were completely opposed to the war, which is why it was a period of the Bolshevik Revolution and so on. Uh, but this disconnect is enormous. But why is the political leadership so detached? Partly, I suppose, a lot of them are actually... Uh, you know, personally kind of, you know, benefiting from the American connection. For instance, uh, the CDU leader was actually an employee. He's an ex-employee of, 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 of an American company. Now, similarly, you find large numbers of people in positions of leadership who either are directly or hope to become uh, members of the executives of American companies and so on. Now, that is obviously one thing that cannot explain everything, but but that's kind of one important factor. Uh, 
The second important factor is, of course, the fear of the Americans. I mean, I mm. think this fear is quite significant now. Fear not only generally in geopolitical terms, but there's also a more direct fear. You see a lot. I mean, Americans have got a rule now, according to which if there is any, in quotes, corruption, which happens, uh, I mean, you know, by any corporate entity which involves either payment in dollar or use of American uh, kind of, you know, uh, companies like Yahoo and, and, and so on and so forth, then the executives of that company which is engaged in such corruption can be criminally prosecuted right. in the United States. States. Now, on the basis of which, as you know, the, the General Electric has taken over a big French company. And, and, and this is being used by American companies to take over French companies. And European politicians are not really in a position to intervene because they are really particularly scared in, 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 in this context. So, so there is a fear factor. Mm -hmm. uh, which is both geopolitical as well as uh, more kind of directly palpable fear of being arm twisted by the Americans. Uh, and of course, there is the other factor, namely that, you know, they, they, they are so integrated into American capitalism. Right. And I suppose there is also a general feeling which many would be having that Western hegemony, any collapse of Western hegemony is something that might affect them as well. In other words, it's true that if Europe decided to move out of the American orbit, then the multipolar world we would be seeing would be one in which Europe would be a pole. But on the other hand, uh, there's an uncertainty because Europe has, after all, been generally towing the American line in, in broad terms for a long time. So the unipolar world is one in which they have enjoyed the kind of hegemony which is under threat. And I mean, that, that's, that raises a question of, you know, because Europe trades so much with Russia, obviously, which is why the sanctions have done so much damage to the European economy. Um, and they also do a lot of trade with China, right? They depend on these countries for so many raw commodities, as well as other parts that come from China that are made in China. Um, and then I, what does Europe get from America? I mean, it's not like there's a gas pipeline from America where America can send Europe gas. Uh, I suppose the integration, of course, with American capitalism has more to do with Europe's relationship with American financial institutions. So in that sense, like, who does Europe actually need more? China and Russia or America in terms of actually basic survival, like things that you need to make sure that your people don't starve and don't die of, you know, freezing to death in the winter. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. You see, because I think this, this American intransigence is really part of the neocon strategy. Okay. Now, I think the neocon strategy is something which has been gaining ascendancy. Uh, and, and I think, after all, the Americans themselves traded so much with the Chinese. So the, 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 the point is China's emergence as a major economic power owes much to China's relationship with the United States in the past. So I think I, I think the Americans having, in a sense, presided over a world in which China was coming up are now suddenly afraid that, look, my God, the, the, the Chinese have become powerful. And, uh, and that is why the neocon thing really appeals to uh, the American powers, the American establishment, uh, more than it did before. And in any case, there is a kind of exaggeration or exaggerated fear of China, which the neocons play upon. Now, I think Europe in that period was also part of this entire process of building up relations with Russia and China and so on. But now suddenly, now suddenly that the Americans have become aggressive, I think Europe finds itself torn between, on the one hand, their close relations with Russia and China, on the other hand, uh, the United States. And I think a lot of them believe that actually Russia can be weakened to a point 
where you know i mean they 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 would ultimately win the the ukraine war i, I mean win the war in the sense that you know that they can have a change of leadership right. in russia uh, and uh, and if so then may as well stay with the americans Okay, so you mentioned earlier these protests in these European countries, such as Germany, the Czech Republic. We've seen an explosion of protests in France uh, and quite a brutal reaction to them in response, basically against this war. In Germany, they even there was even protests against the closing of Nord Stream 2. Um, right. But like you mentioned, these working class protests are having no impact on the policy choices of the established parties uh, in Germany. And then, you know, you you recently wrote about after the Italian elections where this woman, this Mussolini admiring fascist woman is now the prime minister. Um, and you mention it, that it's European neo-fascism that's reaping the benefits from a total unconcern of the established political parties for the working people. And that this is why we see this ascendancy of neo-fascism, these far right victories. You mention also in the Italian context that the Italian situation has an important lesson. When the left gets hegemonized by neoliberalism, a shift to the neo-fascist right becomes inevitable. So can you talk about the lesson there for the left globally in dealing with the rise, with this neo-fascist threat and the dangers of these weakened European economies on local politics across Europe and what that means in terms of the rise of fascists is what we're seeing in Italy and Sweden, uh, a trend that we're going to see more of moving forward as the European economies become weaker. Yes. Uh, in fact, I'd like to go back a little to neoliberalism. In, in, in other words, neoliberalism was something which enormously increased economic inequalities, income inequalities, wealth inequalities all over the world. And what is more, because of the fact that capital got globalized, you had the relocation of uh, factories, investments from the first world to the third world to countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, China and, so, and, and India and so on. You actually had a curb on the capacity of European and American trade unions to obtain higher wage increases. Because obviously, if the workers went on strike to obtain higher wage increases, then the factory would, would, would shift to Indonesia. So because of that, there was a weakening in the workers' bargaining strength all over the advanced countries. And it's a well-known fact that actually uh, uh, real wages have not really increased noticeably during this entire neoliberal period. Joseph Stiglitz made a calculation which says that, you know, if you take the average wage of a male American worker between 1968 and 2011, then that increase in money wage deflated by the price index means the increase in real wage is if anything marginally negative that means real wage in 2011 was marginally lower than in 1968 okay maybe if you take some other year maybe you don't exactly get the same result but fundamentally there is a tendency for the stagnation in wages even before the current inflation and so on began so neoliberalism was an attack on the working class and an attack on the working class everywhere attack on the working people everywhere including the peasantry in countries like ours countries like mine uh, but at the same time in europe it was an attack on the working class the crisis of neoliberalism actually worsened this attack because obviously when there's a crisis of neoliberalism, even that hope that maybe someday there would be a trickle down of benefits that goes and you have greater unemployment and so on in a period of crisis. And this is something which actually has happened from 2008 onwards after mm -hmm. the financial crisis. Then you look at the impact of the pandemic and subsequently as you know i mean the 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 pandemic greatly worsened the unemployment situation and the beginning of the recovery from the pandemic led to a revival of inflation now you have on top of it the inflation that is superimposed by the ukraine war therefore the working class has been in in europe has been under attack right for a very long period 
And in this, the established political parties have been complicit in this attack on the working class. Unfortunately, the left has collapsed in over much of Europe. And that left which exists also is in some sense, uh, 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 you know, kind of too muted, if not exactly complicit in this attack on the working class. You, For, for, for instance, uh, in, in Italy, you don't really have that old communist party anymore. But the democratic party that is really a successor to the old party is one that was actually supporting the Draghi government and the Draghi government to the completely neoliberal government. So it is in that connection that fascism emerges. Fascism emerges in the period of crisis of capitalism. Uh, as indeed the earlier fascism had done. And it's in this period of crisis of capitalism that, that, that fascism becomes far powerful. The fascists become powerful because they appeal to the workers who are being unemployed, who are suffering from inflation and so on, who are being economically squeezed. Uh, now, the fascism, however, is something which invariably betrays the working class. It in, invariably makes peace with and promotes the interests of monopoly capital when it comes to power. Sometimes even before it comes to power mm -hmm. in, 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 in countries, it actually gets promoted by big business in order to uh, uh, kind of, you know, because because of the fact that it is authoritarian, because of the fact that it, 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 in, it, it creates this concept of the other, it it changes the discourse and 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 it uh, it it kind of you know uh, loosens fascist tongues to attack opponents and so on. You actually find that this is very useful from the point of view of big business. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, fascism does not in the beginning necessarily support big business. It does so either when it's close to power or when it is in power, when sometimes it actually even turns against its own supporters because of its support for big business, which is what had happened in, 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 in Germany, for instance. So, uh, currently, the main political elements which actually were articulating workers' uh, demands, workers' distress, were actually the fascist elements. Now, that is changing because in France, for instance, the CGT and Mélenchon, the political formation, they are now taking the lead in the workers' demonstrations. In Germany, as I mentioned, Sarah Wagenknecht, had actually said that, look, no matter if the fascists are leading demos and so on against this, that should not prevent us from doing the same. So I think as the left comes on board to defend the workers more and more, I think this is going to weaken the hold of fascism. It can prevent. But if the left does not, and if the established political parties continue to turn a blind eye to workers' protests, then of course the only way that this is going to lead is towards the triumph of fascism. Yeah, it's Already, quite frightening. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, go it's ahead. quite frightening. I mean, look at Sweden, look at Italy, and the the, 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 the most frightful situation is Germany. Mm. I mean, of course, it's not as if you would have a single fascist government, but you would have a government uh, like in Italy where they would uh, wield considerable power. And, you know, the, the, the shift in favor of the fascists is very sudden. That is the case that had happened in the 1930s when Hitler's election uh, percentage of votes was very low before he actually came to power. And suddenly in 1933, the, it shot up. Similarly, when you look at Meloni's percent, uh, party's per percentage of votes, it was only 4% in 2018, and it's 26% now. So, 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 you know, they can suddenly come, become powerful, therefore become a powerful part of the government, without them you can't form a government, and, and, and when that happens, then they slowly uh, begin throttling democracy. You know, I've I've read about in the past about how fascism will try to use like progressive or left sounding rhetoric at times, right, to try to reel people in. But now it's like I'm seeing it happen in real time. I don't know how closely you follow U.S. personalities, but we have this character on Fox News called Tucker Carlson, for example, yes, um, yes. who people are quite familiar with. And he's I mean, this guy, he tried to join the CIA when he was younger. He comes from like a very 
wealthy uh, family who has like, I, I don't know, they have like some sort of dynasty in, in uh, like ketchup making. I don't know. They make some brand of either ketchup or mustard or something that they got rich off of. Um, you know, and he's been in media for a very long time, but he somehow refashioned himself as like the voice of the working class. And you know what they all, what him and others often say is they'll use this, this, uh, this language of, oh, it's the problem is the corporate elites. They'll say right. this very vague corporate, it's never capitalism, right? Yeah, it's never yeah, imperialism. Right, yeah. It's yes. just the corporate elites are against us. And that's why we have to, by the way, go to war with China. And it's like, what? But <laughs> they have these really big platforms to say these kinds of things. And it is quite frightening because people, people are, you know, experiencing hardship and, you know, suffering financially. And like some of the biggest platforms in America have figures like this telling them that, the problem is the corporate elites, and that's why you should hate immigrants. And it's just, it's definitely an uphill battle for the left, um, but it's not written in stone. And that's what's important. Um, and yeah. I, I appreciate what you're saying about leftist groups in, in Europe, hopefully taking the lead in some of these protests, at least. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm hoping that, yeah. Fingers crossed. Yes. Um, but <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about Russia. So... It's been interesting because, you know, we heard elites in the beginning of the war uh, in February saying we're going to turn the ruble into rubble. Right. But all no, this time, you know, and we're going to bring the Russians to their knees. But all this time later, it's been, what, seven months. And the sanctions on Russia are quite severe. Um, and certainly, you know, they'll have an effect. I'm sure they've had some impact. But the ruble is not rubble. The Russian economy <laughs> seems to still be functioning. The country has not collapsed um economically so to what do you attribute russia's ability to so far weather these sanctions well you know i mean fundamentally russia has oil and gas i mean the the, the, the way the way i see it is that when you have a reserve currency why why does the dollar become a reserve currency or the pound sterling before that and so on you know uh a reserve currency is one in which generally people must have faith that its value must not go down in terms of what? In terms of the world of commodities. I mean, in, in other words, it must never be the case that you have very substantial inflation, uh, uh, you know, in terms of that particular currency or in, in that particular economy. Now, as far as the workers are concerned, okay, inflation can come about either if there is a rise in uh, workers' money wages or if there's a rise in the prices of primary commodities. Now, money wages do not rise. You control, I mean, money wage increases can be controlled by generating unemployment which is what capitalism does. It's never the case that capitalism operates close to full employment. And if need be, they can always uh, increase the, the, the unemployment rate. As far as control over primary commodities is concerned, the most important primary commodity is oil. Mm. And as a result, if you can manage to have the price of oil, which is more or less linked to your currency, in that case, that currency becomes strong. And I think the strength of the dollar arose in a sense from the fact that really the world was on, has been on an oil standard. You know, in, in other words, you can have fluctuation, day-to-day -day fluctuation in oil prices. But on the whole, everybody knows that oil price in terms of dollar is, is, is going to be roughly around a certain level. Now, Russia has got oil and natural gas. And I think that is why Russia is very well placed because Russia literally is sitting on top of this very precious commodity. And of course, as of now, the world is not in a position to move away from oil. True that in future it may happen, but not at the moment. Therefore, you find that, that, that two things are happening. Firstly, that the dollar is rising in terms of its value vis-a-vis virtually every capitalist currency, vis-a-vis -vis the pound sterling, vis-a-vis -vis the euro, vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, all third world currency. But the dollar has actually fallen vis-a-vis -vis the ruble. Originally, the moment they, they announced sanctions and so on, there was a sharp fall in the ruble, then it came up. And it continues to be above 
the level where the ruble traded for the dollar before the sanctions began. Wow. In, in, in other words, yeah. So, so, so the ruble has actually gained the most relative to the dollar. Uh, the ruble has gained, but every other currency has gone down. So the sanctions have had this effect that while they were meant to attack Russia, they have not attacked Russia, but they have, actually they have attacked all kinds of capitalist currencies. <laughs> That, of course, is because Oops. of the rise in interest rates, uh, the, the, the rise in American interest rates. And if they rise further, uh, as indeed the inflation is, is going to accelerate, and with the acceleration of inflation, the further rise in interest rates, further generation of an engineered recession. And if that happens, then, of course, you find that the dollar might appreciate even more vis-a-vis -vis the country's of the uh, of 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 the capitalist world, including the Western powers, but doll, uh, ruble is very difficult to uh, kind of you know um, beat down, <laughs> as it's been demonstrated. You know, I'm curious when we talk about how to deal with inflation in a capitalist country and how the response is to raise interest rates to drive up unemployment. How would a socialist country deal with inflation? I imagine it would be different. <laughs> Well, price controls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, you know, I mean, kind of instead of generating unemployment to beat down inflation, just have price controls. After all, the current inflation has been fueled very significantly by an increase in prices via a rise in profit margins right. of the big firms. You know, so 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 you simply. Put a, put a cap on the profit margins, put a cap on prices. I mean, of course, the socialist country probably would not have that many multinational corporations, <laughs> private right. corporate entities jacking up profit margins. But, but, but fundamentally, price control would be the way of doing this. Yeah, that makes sense. And and so I wanted to also ask you, since we're talking about, you mentioned oil as a Russian commodity. I mean, it's so interesting how... If you look at who the U.S. is sanctioning, right, because they, they've just gone overboard with sanctions. In many cases, it's the world's biggest oil oil suppliers, right? You have not just Russia, but Iran, Venezuela. I mean, these countries Venezuela. have some of the biggest oil reserves. Absolutely. How How long can a country like the U.S. continue to sanction such major oil producing countries without a consequence? Maybe we're seeing some of those consequences now, actually. But at some point, don't you risk creating a situation where oil is traded in another currency um, if you continue to remove these oil producing countries from the international market? Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the offshoots which of, of, of the sanctions against Russia is the following. In the old days, when the Soviet Union existed, Say India had a, an arrangement with the Soviet Union where we did not trade with Russia in terms of dollars. It was a bilateral agreement where the exchange rate between the ruble and the rupee was actually fixed. And at that exchange rate, Russians sold their goods to us, imported goods from us. And if it is the case that there was some kind of a balance, then that balance remained. It could be resolved over a period of time by their buying more goods from us or selling more goods to us. But the dollar did not enter the picture. Mm. Therefore, these bilateral agreements or regional agreements are agreements which actually uh, bypass the dollar. Now, I think there's a revival of these kinds of agreements all over again. As a matter of fact, it's quite amusing that 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 India is importing oil from Russia some of which it is exporting to Europe at a higher price because you know that's that's a way of of of, of Europe shall we say bypassing the sanctions you know mm. that, that they, they, they don't or pretending that they are bypassing the sanctions they don't buy directly from Russia but they actually buy indirectly uh, via India as, as small amounts but on the other hand so the dollar's role as the currency in which trade happens among all countries is going to go down. 
Mm-hmm. The dollar's role as a form of holding wealth, that's the other role. You know, people hold their wealth in dollars or dollar denominated assets. As I said, arises because of the fact that the oil prices were fixed in terms of dollars, more or less fixed in terms of dollars. But I think that is likely to be changing because of the OPEX decision and so on. Uh, it'll take a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the dollar's hegemony is going to end. But I think we are seeing the beginning of a process, as you said rightly, in which dollar's hegemony would come to an would 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 be declining. Now, this is not to say that the ruble is going to uh, take the place of the dollar, because obviously, you know, I mean, Russia is a much weaker economy, and Russia does not have the kind of clout internationally as a power in order to kind of arm twist countries into into following its. Um, it's it's lying, uh, but you see one one very interesting thing is that this OPEC decision to curtail output by two million barrels a day is something which basically means that you know the quotas of all these countries which produce and export oil are going to be cut. Okay, while the price is going to rise. Now, as far as Russia is concerned, the amount it was exporting was already below its earlier quota. Mm -hmm. Therefore, even if that earlier quota is reduced, the amount it actually exports is not going to be affected by it. Therefore, effectively, Russia would go on exporting the same amount as it was doing before, but at a higher price. Mm -hmm. So that its foreign exchange earnings would be much larger than they were before this decision, which is why the Americans were pressurizing the Saudis not to uh, agree to a cut in, in, in oil. But, but the Saudi uh, revenues also would be going up, so which is why they did agree. But on the other hand, it, it, it the idea of bringing Russia to its knees is an idea which is just not going to work. Wow. <laughs> oh, at some point, the Americans will realize that, but for now, they're still kind of delusional and believe it will happen. But, you know, one of the last thing I wanted to to ask you about is something I'm a little I've been a bit curious about in terms of the ideologies at play in this current Cold War that we're in, because in the past, during the Soviet days, it was a very clear ideological war. The Cold War at the time it was capitalism versus communism. Right. I mean, there's some nuances there, of course. Um, but for the most part, you could you could view it that way. Mm-hmm. The capitalist world versus like the socialist bloc, the communist world. And so I'm I'm curious how you might explain the ideological divide today, because it's obviously it's not the same conflict, right, um, where you have U.S. led capitalism versus Soviet led socialism. But there is this Cold War taking place. And I've, I've heard I've seen the argument uh, that this current Cold War actually still does have an economic element to it in the sense that it's between Western financialized neoliberal capitalism versus socialism in China and then a kind of state-led industrial capitalism like you see in Russia or Iran. I'm curious if you would agree with that characterization or just in general, what's your explanation for the kind of ideological dividing lines in this current Cold War? Or maybe there isn't one. No, 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 no. There certainly is. You know, if you look at Putin's speeches, which he makes to to the Russian parliament, he's talking about imperialism. In, in fact, some of those speeches are reminiscent of Lenin. Now, he is not invoking socialism, of course not. But on the other hand, he is actually attacking American imperialism. So the attack on unipolarity is seen by Russia I mean, is 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 defended by Russia, no matter what Putin's own kind of belief may be, uh, as an attack on imperialism. His his argument is that imperialism is again attacking us. Hitler had attacked us, and so on, and and now you have American imperialism attacking us. So the 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 phraseology of imperialism is something which is common between then and now. It's not so much capitalist imperialism the way Lenin had talked about. But nonetheless, there is some idea of, of, of American imperialism that people like Putin are talking about. And of course, the Chinese would also be talking about it exactly in a very similar manner. So I think it is not so much capitalism versus socialism, but it is actually a hegemonic American imperialism vis-a-vis, as they would claim, independent countries. 
mm-hmm. you know, to, to be, trying to be left alone. Uh, so, so I think that's the way. I mean, it's and that is exactly the way that a lot of the third world countries are seeing uh, this entire crisis because much of the third world has not lined up behind the Americans. You know, I mean, they they make immense efforts. They arm twist small countries like anything in order to get the UN vote. But big countries, not just, uh, you know, not just China, but India, Bangladesh, Indonesia. I mean, big populous countries have not fallen behind, uh, for, for, for fallen in line with the American position because they, they again see it as, as, as a challenge to a hegemonic unipolar world. Uh, dominated by the Americans. Yeah. So I would say it, it, there is an ideological element to it, but it's not the old ideological element. Right. And it is it is amazing to see countries like who are even so close with the Americans. I mean, we talked about the Saudis earlier, but even Brazil under someone like Bolsonaro, <laughs> it's just at the end of the day, you have to also be able to like feed your people. Um, and you can't just, dist- well, some countries are willing to, but most countries aren't willing to completely destroy their own economies to weaken Russia, which they actually want to have a good relationship with. And India is a perfect example of that as well. India has refused to get behind the U.S. Um, Professor Patnaik, I want to thank you once again for joining me to break all this down. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to add before we, we end the show? No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on this show. And thank you for your discussion conversation with me thanks for watching everyone if you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content and if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content head over to patreon.com breakthrough news